Hey guys, Dr. Sharun here and welcome to NCRT Audible by Neat Buddy, where we are providing your beloved NCRT in audible form. Because more you listen, more you learn. The NCRT we are following is the new NCRT and the chapter we are going to present to you today is Breathing and Exchange of Gases. As you have read earlier, oxygen is utilized by organisms to indirectly break down simple molecules like glucose, amino acids, fatty acids, etc. to derive energy to perform various activities. Carbon dioxide, which is harmful, is also released during the above catabolic reaction. It is therefore evident that oxygen has to be continuously provided to the cell and carbon dioxide produced by the cell have to be released out. This process of exchange of oxygen from the atmosphere with carbon dioxide produced by the cell is called breathing, commonly known as respiration. Place your hands on your chest. You can feel the chest moving up and down. You know that this is due to breathing. How do we breathe? The respiratory organs and the mechanism of breathing are described in the following sections of this chapter. 17.1 Respiratory Organs Mechanism of breathing vary among different groups of animals depending mainly on their habitat and level of organization. Lower invertebrates like sponges, sealantrates, flatworms, etc. exchange oxygen with carbon dioxide by simple diffusion over the entire body surface. Earthworms use their moist cuticle and insects have a network of tube, tracheal tubes, to transport atmospheric air within the body. Special vascularized structures called gills, branchial respiration, are used by most of the aquatic arthropods and mollusks, whereas vascularized bag called lungs, pulmonary respiration are used by terrestrial forms for exchange of gases. Among vertebrates, fishes use gills, whereas amphibians, reptiles, birds and mammals respire through lungs. Amphibians like frogs can respire through their moist skin, cutaneous respiration also. Human Respiratory System We have a pair of external nostrils opening out above the upper lips. This leads to a nasal chamber through the nasal passage. The nasal chamber opens into the pharynx, a portion of which is common passage for food and air. The pharynx opens through the larynx region into the trachea. Larynx is a cartilaginous box which helps in sound production and hence is called sound box. During swallowing, glottis can be covered by a thin elastic cartilaginous flap called epiglottis to prevent entry of food into the larynx. Trachea is a straight tube extending up to the mid thoracic cavity which divides at the level of 5th thoracic vertebrae into right and left primary bronchi. Each bronchi undergoes repeated division to form secondary and tertiary bronchi and bronchioles, ending up in very thin terminal bronchioles. The trachea, primary, secondary and tertiary bronchi and initial bronchioles are supported by incomplete cartilaginous rings. Each terminal bronchiole gives rise to number of very thin, irregularly walled, vascularized, bag-like structure called alveoli. The branching network of the bronchi, bronchioles and the alveoli comprise the lung. We have two lungs which are covered by double-layered pleura with pleural fluid in between them. It reduces the friction on the lung surface. The outer pleural membrane is in close contact with the thoracic lining whereas the inner pleural membrane is in close contact with the lung surface. The part starting with the external nostril up to the terminal bronchiole constitutes the conducting part whereas the alveoli and the ducts form the respiratory or the exchange part of the respiratory system. The conducting part transports the atmospheric air to the alveoli, clears it of foreign particles, humidifies and also brings the air to the body temperature. Exchange part is the site of actual diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide between blood and atmospheric air. The lungs are situated in the thoracic cavity which is anatomically an airtight chamber. The thoracic chamber is formed dorsally by vertebral column, ventrally by sternum, laterally by the ribs and on lower side by the dome-shaped diaphragm. The anatomical setup of the lungs in the thorax is such that any change in the volume of thoracic cavity will be reflected in the lungs or the pulmonary cavity. Such an arrangement is essential for breathing as we cannot directly alter the pulmonary volume. Respiration involves the following steps. Breathing or pulmonary ventilation by which atmospheric air is drawn in, carbon dioxide rich alveolar air is released out. 
Diffusion of gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide across the alveolar membrane, transport of gases by the blood, diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide between the blood and tissues, utilization of oxygen by the cells for catabolic reaction and resultant release of carbon dioxide. Cellular respiration has been dealt in chapter 14 separately. Section 17.2 Mechanism of Breathing Breathing involves two stages. Inspiration during which the atmospheric air is drawn in and expiration by which the alveolar air is released out. The movement of the air into and out of the lung is carried out by creating a pressure gradient between the lungs and the atmosphere. Inspiration can occur if the pressure within the lung, intrapulmonary pressure, is less than the atmospheric pressure. That is, there is a negative pressure in lung with respect to the atmospheric pressure. Similarly, expiration takes place when the intrapulmonary pressure is higher than the atmospheric pressure. The diaphragm and the specialized set of muscles, external and internal intercostal between the ribs, help in general generation of such gradients. Inspiration is initiated by contraction of diaphragm which increases the volume of thoracic chamber and enteroposterior axis. Contraction of external intercostal muscles lifts up the ribs and the sternum causing an increase in the volume of thoracic chamber and dorsoventral axis. The overall increase in the thoracic volume causes a similar increase in the pulmonary volume. An increase in the pulmonary volume decreases the intrapulmonary pressure to less than the atmospheric pressure which forces the air outside to move into the lung, that is inspiration. Relaxation of the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles returns the diaphragm and sternum to their normal position and reduce the thoracic volume, thereby the pulmonary volume. This leads to an increase in intrapulmonary pressure to slightly above the atmospheric pressure, causing the expulsion of air from the lungs, that is expiration. We have the ability to increase the strength of inspiration and expiration with help of additional muscles in abdomen. On an average, an adult human breathes 12 to 16 times per minute. The volume of the air involved in breathing movement can be estimated by using a spirometer which helps in clinical assessment of pulmonary functions. Respiratory Volumes and Capacities Tidal Volume Volume of air inspired or expired during a normal respiration. It is approximately 500 ml. That is, a healthy man can inspire or expire approximately 6,000 to 8,000 ml of air per minute. Inspiratory reserve volume. Additional volume of air a person can inspire by forceful inspiration. This averages 2,500 ml to 3,000 ml. Expiratory reserve volume. Additional volume of air that a person can expire by a forceful expiration. This averages 1,000 to 1,100 ml. Residual volume. Volume of air remaining in lung even after forcible expiration. This averages to around 1100 to 1200 ml. By adding up a few of respiratory volumes described above, one can derive various pulmonary capacities which can be used in clinical diagnosis. Inspiratory capacity, total volume of air a person can inspire after normal expiration. This includes the tidal volume and inspiratory reserve volume. Expiratory capacity, total volume of air a person can expire after normal inspiration. This includes tidal volume and the expiratory reserve capacity. Functional residual volume, volume of air that remains in the lung after normal expiration. It includes the expiratory reserve volume with residual volume. Vital capacity, the maximum volume of air a person can breathe in after a forced expiration. This includes the expiratory reserve volume, the tidal volume and the inspiratory reserve volume or maximum volume of air a person can breathe out after forced inspiration. Total lung capacity. Total volume of air accommodated in the lung at end of a forced inspiration. This includes the residual volume, expiratory reserve volume, tidal volume and inspiratory reserve volume or Vital capacity plus residual volume. Section 17.3 Exchange of Gases Alveoli are the primary site for the exchange of gases. Exchange of gases also occurs between blood and tissues. Oxygen and carbon dioxide are exchanged in these sites by simple diffusion, mainly based on pressure or concentration gradient. Solubility of gases as well as the thickness of the membrane involved in the diffusion are also some important factors that can affect the rate of diffusion. Pressure contributed by an individual gas in a mixture of gases is called partial pressure and is 
represented as PO2 for oxygen, PCO2 for carbon dioxide. Partial pressures of these gases in the atmospheric air and the two sides of diffusion are given as follows. Oxygen partial pressure in atmospheric air is 159, in alveoli is 104, deoxygenated blood 40, oxygenated blood 95 and tissues 40. For carbon dioxide, atmospheric air 0.3. Alveoli 40 mm of mercury, deoxygenated blood 45, oxygenated blood 40, and tissues 45. The data given in the above table clearly indicates a concentration gradient for oxygen from alveoli to blood and blood to tissues. Similarly, a gradient is present for carbon dioxide in opposite direction, that is, from tissues to blood and blood to alveoli. As the solubility of the carbon dioxide is 25 times higher than that of oxygen, the amount of carbon dioxide that can diffuse through the diffusion membrane per unit difference in the partial pressure is much higher compared to that of oxygen. The diffusion membrane is made up of three major layers, namely the thin squamous epithelium of the alveoli, the endothelium of the alveolar capillaries and the basement membrane composed of the thin basement membrane supporting the squamous epithelium and basement membrane surrounding the single layer endothelial cells of the capillaries in between them. However, its total thickness is even less than a millimeter. Therefore, all the factors in our body are favorable for diffusion of oxygen from alveoli to tissues and that of carbon dioxide from tissues to the alveoli. Section 17.4 transport of gases. Blood is the medium of transport for oxygen and carbon dioxide. About 97% of oxygen is transported by RBC in the blood. The remaining 3% of oxygen is carried in dissolved state through the plasma. Nearly 20-25% to of car carbon dioxide is transported by RBC, whereas 70% of it is carried as bicarbonate. 7% of carbon dioxide is carried in dissolved state. Transport of oxygen. Hemoglobin is a red-colored iron-containing pigment present in RBCs. Oxygen can bind to hemoglobin in a reversible manner to form oxyhemoglobin. Each hemoglobin molecule can carry a maximum of four molecules of oxygen. Binding of oxygen with hemoglobin is primarily related to partial pressure of oxygen, partial pressure of carbon dioxide, hydrogen ion concentration and temperature are the other factors that can interfere with this binding. A sigmoid curve is obtained when percentage saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen is plotted against the partial pressure of oxygen. This curve is called oxygen dissociation curve and is highly useful in studying effect of factors like partial pressure of carbon dioxide, H plus ion concentration, etc. on binding of oxygen to hemoglobin. In alveoli, where there is high partial pressure of oxygen, low partial pressure of carbon dioxide, lesser H plus ion concentration and lower temperature, the factors are all favorable for formation of oxyhemoglobin. Whereas in the tissues, where low partial pressure of oxygen, high partial pressure of carbon dioxide, high H plus ion concentration and higher temperature exist, the conditions are favorable for dissociation of oxygen from oxyhemoglobin. This clearly indicates oxygen gets bound to hemoglobin in the lung surface and gets dissociated at tissues. Every 100 ml of oxygenated blood can deliver around 5 ml of oxygen to the tissues under normal physiological conditions. Transport of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is carried by hemoglobin as carb amino hemoglobin about 20 to 25 percent. This binding is related to partial pressure of carbon dioxide. Partial pressure of oxygen is a major factor which could affect this binding. When partial pressure of carbon dioxide is high and partial pressure of oxygen is low as in tissues, more binding of carbon dioxide occurs. Whereas when the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is low and partial pressure of oxygen is high as in alveoli, dissociation of carbon dioxide from carb amino hemoglobin happens. That is carbon dioxide which is bound to hemoglobin from the tissues is delivered to the alveoli. RBCs contain a very high concentration of enzyme carbonic anhydrase and minute quantities of same is present in plasma too. This enzyme facilitates the following reaction in both directions. Carbon dioxide plus water in presence of carbonic anhydrase forms carbonic acid. Carbonic acid in presence of carbonic anhydrase 
dehydrase uh, dissociates into H plus ion and bicarbonate ion. At the tissue site, where partial pressure of carbon dioxide is high due to catabolism, carbon dioxide diffuses into the blood, RBCs and plasma and forms bicarbonate and H plus ion. At the alveolar site, where the partial pressure of oxygen is low, the reaction proceeds in opposite direction leading to formation of carbon dioxide and water. Thus, carbon dioxide trapped as bicarbonate at the tissue level and transported to the alveoli and is released out as carbon dioxide. Every 100 ml of deoxygenated blood delivers approximately 4 ml of carbon dioxide. Regulation of respiration. Human beings have a significant ability to maintain and moderate respiratory rhythm to suit the demand of the body tissues. This is done by neural system. A specialized center present in medulla region of the brain called the respiratory rhythm center is primarily responsible for this regulation. Another center present in pons region of the brain called the pneumotaxic center can moderate the function of respiratory rhythm center. Neural signals from this center can reduce the duration of inspiration and thereby alter respiratory rate. A chemosensitive area is situated adjacent to the rhythm center which is sensitive to carbon dioxide and hydrogen ion. Increase in these substances can activate this center, which in turn can signal the rhythm center to make necessary adjustments in the respiratory process by which these substances can be eliminated. Receptors associated with aortic arc and carotid artery can also recognize changes in carbon dioxide and H plus concentration and send necessary signals to rhythm center for remedial action. The role of oxygen in the regulation of respiratory rhythm is quite insignificant. Disorders of respiratory system Asthma Asthma is a difficult Difficulty in breathing causing wheezing due to inflammation of bronchi and bronchioles. Emphysema is a chronic disorder in which alveolar walls are damaged due to which respiratory surface is decreased. One of the major causes is cigarette smoke. Occupational respiratory disorder. In certain industries, especially those involving grinding and stone breaking, so much dust is produced that the defense mechanism of body cannot fully cope with the situation. Long exposure can give rise to inflammation leading to fibrosis, proliferation of fibrous tissue and thus causing serious lung damage. Workers in such industries should wear protective masks. Hope you found the Audible NCRT helpful. I'll see you guys in the next episode. Till then, all the best and keep working hard. It's me, Dr. Sharon, signing off.